It's really a great pleasure to see you all here, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be at The Kitchen, who is hosting us, which is hosting us, they are hosting us, as we prepare the big grant reopening of MoMA, which will happen starting next week, slowly but surely will trickle in, and then it'll become a flood when the gates will open. So thank you very much to our kitchen colleagues for this great hospitality. And tonight we're here to talk about one of the uh, our usual incendiary subjects, and incendiary it is. Actually, I have to say, and I can speak also for on behalf of Samantha Ozer and Theano Seraferas, who are helping with this salon, in particular Sam, it was her dream salon. It's been a very interestingly controversial salon to prepare in terms of the different issues that we encountered. Some we already expected, of course. Others were surprises. But first of all, I want to tell you, for those of you that are here for the first time, there's very few, maybe our speakers are the only one. It's a little bit of a family. MoMA R&D salons and MoMA R&D in general are meant to show people that the museum can be an R&D for people and for society. Ah, I don't like to stay put, so I'm going to use one of these. I'm going to use one of these. Do I have to do something? No, you just put me out. Oh, perfect. Great. Thank you so much. Um, they're meant to really show people that museums can be the R&D for society. So we like to tackle difficult subjects or subjects that one might have not known are difficult, but then they will discover that they're difficult. And so by doing this, we try to offer people new ways to think about the world, about art, of course, but also about other human beings. Hair. Hair is a really interesting subject and unexpected at times. So you see here the work of uh, Judy Eng, who is a photographer that traveled to different parts of China and the world for Vogue magazine. But in particular, she traveled a thousand miles away from Beijing to discuss and to study this particular group of, uh, of women, actually all the women of a village, that cut their hair only once in their whole lifetime. And for the rest of their life, they grow locks that become ways to actually uh, entangle and uh, be very proud about themselves and to really flaunt a culture that is different from everybody else's. And of course, this is a way to represent hair, but another slide that represents hair more than anybody would know is this. I'm sure that you've seen it so many times. This is the other side of hair or the same side of hair. It's a photo from 2009 and it's President Obama that is bowing to this five-year-old that wants to really feel if it's his same hair that the president has on his head. So it's a beautiful uh, picture that says so much. But you know, when we talk about hair, we talk about culture, we talk about religion, we talk about different parts of the world. It's material culture and it's also uh, rituals, you know, and uh, it's a way to transfer knowledge amongst generations, between generations and between people. I I wish that I could go through every single one of these images and tell you more about it, but we don't have the time. We'll try to actually publish a legenda of it on the website once we're done. But you see here just a little bit of the different facets of hair. Hair that is adorned, that is sculpted, that is hidden, that is like framed, that is cut, that is cut for ritualistic ways, you know. So it's really amazing how many facets hair has and how many different ways we have to express its potential. Hair, of course, also is about identity. It's about flaunting. It's about sculpting and really make oneself. It's almost like when you see a bird that wants to show its feathers and wants to really go as wide as possible. And we see it in history. We see it in history with the King Charles and Marie Antoinette, of course. But then there's also the whole significance of hair for drag queens. And as you know, Lady Bunny was supposed to speak here tonight, but unfortunately, she uh, remained without voice at all, which is the worst that can happen to an operatic diva as she is. So we don't have her tonight, but we have uh, some of her representations of some of her colleagues. And you know, Lady Bunny started Wigstock, which is uh, just a testament to the fact that wigs are so important to drag queens in particular. And interestingly, also, hair is about really building a new crown. And tonight we have Lindsay Day, who's the editor-in-chief of Crown 
Crown magazine, actually, which is uh, a magazine that is about natural hair and natural beauty for African-American women. But in particular, the idea of also having a crown that is sculpted can be manifested in such great events as the Hair Wars, which is an event that started in Detroit in 1991 and is uh, going all over the United States. And actually, last year, it was at MoMA PS1. And also, the uh, Bronner Brothers Hair Show, which is international. These are shows in which uh, you know, um, hair artists, hair artists really show their best feathers and they're quite amazing because they display uh, their best possibilities. But it's also about really building up a new persona for special days. And there's a, a great book by Bill Gaskins, Tamara and Tireka is one of the uh, photos in this book that is called Good Hair and Bad Hair. And also Bill, unfortunately, will not be with us tonight because he had to go to the emergency room at the hospital. So he's fine now, but he sends his best and we actually had a great presentation. He said that maybe he will give it to us to put on, to publish on the website, we will see. But see here, so Tamara and Tireka, Nina Simone, in their way to show the best of themselves for a performance. So hair as performance and also hair as a uh, projection of power and projection of status. So it is really fascinating to see in how many ways it can be deployed. Of course, you know, we're here giving you many different points of view or points of access to the theme of hair. And as, an, as, as a design curator, I could not help also thinking of tools and techniques. And you see here just a few of the machines of torture that women use, and sometimes also men on themselves, from Etienne Zeman permanent wave machine that also was replicated on this side of the ocean by a beautician, Marjorie Stewart Joyner. I remember it. <laughs> and I, had, I was trying to remember it because I think it's very important to remember people's names, you know, especially when you want to build a history. And you see here Madame C.J. Walker, and actually Marjorie gave the license for the permanent wave machine to Madame C.J. Walker, who at her time, in her time, was the richest self-made woman in the United States. She was African American, like Marjorie Stewart Joyner was. So so much of the of the innovation came from African American women. And Madame C.J. Walker built an empire. She came from the South, moved to New York, and built an empire of hair products. And then, of course, we have all the innovations in dryers and uh, other ways to work on hair. And it's a whole universe that is a sight to behold. Now, the politics of hair is another very important topic. The politics of hair, or rather, I should say, hair and politics. And we see here just two facets. At the beginning, I had also put a picture of Bibi Netanyahu with his blue hair. Lately, he's gone really blue, but then we decided to focus instead on President Xi Jinping being gray, because usually most uh, of the former premiers of China were really, really black, jet black hair, so as to show a certain youthfulness to the party. And instead, Xi Jinping, who wants to be a man of the, of the people, is trying, together with his windbreaker, the blue windbreaker, to also show that his hair is, in his own way, natural. So it's quite interesting. And instead, there's nothing in general more unnatural than blonde hair. It turns out that only 2% of the population really has blonde hair. Everybody else is faking it. And why? Well, there are many different reasons. And actually, Claudia Rankin, who uh, had a, a, a whole program here at the kitchen years ago on blonde hair together with a photographer, has been asking many, many women, even African-American women, why they uh, dyed their hair blonde. And nobody can really answer it in a definitive way, but it seems that blonde hair really makes a difference or is something that needs to be tried by people as different as Zoe Kravitz, well, of course, Marilyn Monroe, or Hillary Clinton, that right after she lost the presidency went gray, revealing a more true nature to herself that was as appealing as or even more appealing than the blonde one. So it's really quite interesting. Uh, and uh, between going gray and going blonde, there's maybe the true abyss. So there's so much that can be discussed there. Now, good and bad hair. 
Good and bad hair is also a big deal. We see here three TV personas that go cut their hair in, uh, in a moment of real rebelliousness. So the idea of rebellion and cutting your hair or shaving your hair altogether, we see Sinead O'Connor in the uh, famous moment in which she ripped the Pope's picture and her hair was cut really short. Then we see Emma Gonzalez, who is the Florida youth that was standing up for gun control after the massacre in Florida two years ago. She also shaved her head, but she didn't shave her head because of that particular moment. She had done it before, but that became a symbol nonetheless. Um, not to mention Rose McGowan after the Me Too um, scandal. She also, did, well, she was already wearing it short, even in that case, but it became even more of a symbology. And then there are uh, instances like Taylor Mason in Billions, in which hair is brought short, is kept short, but it's not really about identity, it's rather more about persona. So it's quite fascinating. Uh, of course, there's Gabby Douglas. Gabby Douglas, the Olympic gymnast that was accused and vituperated uh, by everyone for wearing her hair unkempt during the Olympic Games. While all of her other uh, companions, like Ali Reisman, they were not African American, were wearing it that way, but were not at all accused. So even in that case, we have discrimination or different measures and different consideration for different types of people or for different ethnic background. Fascinating enough. And then, of course, this, the whole topic of natural hair, which is incredibly important, and we're using here to introduce it, of course, Angela Davis. Angela Davis, who uh, revealed her afro in the 1960s, in the late 1960s, and also who was trying to describe how important and revolutionary the afro was at that time. But we'll hear tonight from Ebony Davis and from Lindsay Day, especially from Ebony, the fact that the afro is still not completely natural a choice for a model or for a woman in a professional setting. Hair as a way to uh, enact soft or hard power in many different ways. Well, of course, one of the first gestures that happens once you're imprisoned is that your hair is cut. And there's the terrible comparison and juxtaposition of the heaps of hair in Auschwitz and the femme tendue, which were the women that were accused of collaboration in France after World War II, and therefore their hair was cut in public. So cutting hair is an immediate form of subjugation and an immediate form of control. Uh, we also might remember the New Jersey referee that told the wrestler that either he cut off his dreadlocks or he had to forfeit the fight. So to this day, discrimination at work or in, in settings that are uh, professional is a reality. And we will have Commissioner Carmeline Malalis to tell us about that uh, more later on. Last but not least, hair as material. You know, we shed hair all the time. At MoMA, creepily, we find these tumbleweeds all the time in the galleries that are, I'm sorry, it's shed skin and shed hair. I'm not kidding, we had them analyzed. So it is a truth, we do shed like animals. And in some cases, instead, we are, uh, um, we, we give our hair or our hair is taken from us. And tonight, Dan Choi and also Emma Tarlow a little bit will tell us about the hair trade. It's, uh, uh, it's above ground and underground aspects. And there are many designers and artists that have worked on this particular topic. You see here, Not by Sana Visser. That's an exploration of how hair could actually help fishermen's economy and actually become almost an environmental uh, um, alternative to many other types of materials. And last but not least, Studio Swine here, Hair Highway. Studio Swine is a very interesting duo of designers that have worked on this idea of treating hair as a precious material and making it, making precious objects out of it, almost as if it were um, an alternative to turtle's shell. So you see, there are so many topics, and we haven't touched 
all of them. You know, we were discussing with Sam and Theano whether we should talk about gray hair or letting hair go gray or the streaks, the signs of authority that hair can impart. And of course, we haven't talked about the sense of community that you find in barber shops, that we, you find in salons. Of course, we haven't talked too much about men's hair at all, and even worse, we haven't talked about hair on other parts of the body. So this is only the beginning, we're only scratching the surface, but as usual, we have an amazing group of people tonight here to help us discuss it. We have Emma Tarlo, who's a great academic from London, she's also a curator. She has written really definitive books on hair that we have recommended to you in the reading list and that I hope you will get. Then we have, these are not in order of appearance, they're just in order in, uh, in uh, uh, clockwise order. Lindsay Day is the director, uh, the editor-in-chief of Crown Magazine, as I was mentioning to you before, and I'm really happy that she's with us tonight because the magazine is devoted to natural hair and beauty, and it's quite a great, great, great publication. And I have to thank Jenny, Jenny Bird, for recommending her. Thank you so much. Carmeline Malalis is the Commissioner of Human Rights for the City of New York, and uh, uh, she's. we were talking before about the point of pressure, if we want to call them, or the battlefields that she works on, and hair is only one of them. Uh, she has published, uh, okay, legal guidance, Oh, thank you. Legal Enforcement Guidance. I never remember. I will say a bill, but it's not a bill. Legal Enforcement Guidance. Um, Anti-discrimination based on hair in the workplace, because that's a thing, uh, believe it or not. Ebony Davis is a model that has decided to really celebrate natural hair, but it took her a while to get to that point, and her uh, path has been really uh, an important example to hear about. And last but not least, Dan Choi, who works on uh, hair trade and on making it really uh, legal and sustainable and just for people. So uh, besides them, we will also have, as usual, some great videos by Raffaele Molica, Noliwe Rooks, The Hair Club, Pat and Anthony Mascolo, Simon Skinner, Studio Swine, and Tina Lassisi. That's a melange of uh, academics, designers, um, and also hair hairstylists, and of course, uh, Nolly Rooks has written wonderful books about hair. So without further ado, I would like to start with the first video. I'm talking about hair salons as a space of like social exploration and um, like a space to champion the anecdotal and also like a place for, you know, to kind of start future collaborations and start future research vectors and things like that. But I was wondering if you thought that it would be a good idea to kind of be more specific. Thank you so much, uh, Paula, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here um, from London. And uh, so hair has, as, as Paula's pointed out, uh, many stories to tell. And some of these are loud stories, and some of them are quite muted. So um, attached to the head, Hair is, as we've seen, saturated with human life. It's literally shot through with tales of, it might be conformity or rebellion, seduction or frustration, stigma and pride and possibilities of transformation. But detached from the head, and I'm hoping that it will appear, yeah, detached from the head and stripped away from sort of bodies and from aspirations and, and cultures even, Hair takes on rather different associations. We see it in its rawness as a, a kind of natural fiber, a renewable crop, uh, easy to grow but actually difficult to harvest, uh, but nonetheless collected up and repurposed uh, to different ends. So dead 
yet curiously lifelike, human yet undeniably animal, uh, both body part and byproduct of the body, this human crop is ontologically confusing. If it's human, kind of wherein lies its humanness. So such hair disturbs, perhaps for the Holocaust atrocities it may conjure up for many, or simply through its suggestion that despite our complexity as human beings, uh, we can nonetheless be reduced to mere fiber. So I want to pose a question. Can human hair ever be entirely alienated from its origins, as packets like this seem to imply? Or is hair forever haunted by its past connections, which might come back, potentially, to trouble us? So to explore these questions, I want to share with you a couple of the trajectories that Indian hair takes as it enters uh, two very different ends of the global market. So the two ends that I'm going to be talking about, so I have to keep checking these are coming on, uh, the, uh, the sort of mass-produced uh, hair extensions, which may be available in the market for $20 a pack. Uh, this is at the Afro Hair Show in, in, in London, sold as Brazilian hair. And at the other end of the spectrum, the orthodox uh, Jewish hair market, where scheitels or wigs often cost upwards of $1,000, upwards towards uh, the most expensive ones I've seen are $6,000. Um, so hair enters these two different markets in very different ways. And in fact, the cheaper range of products are very unlikely to have been cut from the head at all. They are actually much more likely to be fallen hair. That is hair that has actually come out in the process of brushing or washing otherwise known as combings or dead hair, and it's salvaged from the brushes of long-haired women across a whole range of different Asian countries by itinerant traders who travel door to door and collect it up or hook it out of the waste stream. Um, just to give you an idea, you know, this is just my own combings uh, that came out in the shower last night. Uh, someone like me would shed about 30,000 hairs a year, so it actually does a mass up to a quite considerable um, amount. Actually, 70 to 80 percent of the hair that enters the, the market from India is actually this type of waste hair, this type of combings, uh, which enters the head in the form of kind of dusty hair balls that can be sold about a year's worth, but be sold for about one dollar. So such hair is either sent directly to sorting units uh, in India uh, itself, which you can see here, where there's a very extensive uh, labor force employed to untangle it. And the sort of things you can see going on here would be uh, not just untangling the fiber, but also removing lice or taking out the white hairs. There's a whole range of different processes that take place. Or alternatively, it might actually be sold in the form of waste human hairballs uh, over the internet uh, like this to places where labor is even cheaper, such as uh, Myanmar. Uh, so here we have hair arriving uh, in the Pyobwe district in Myanmar, where local women will come in to collect up uh, and buy up, actually, bags of hair to take home into rural areas um, to untangle. And, um, and here you can see it literally dispersed out into very remote parts of the country where employment opportunities are very few. Um, and uh, and, and uh, this offers some sort of labor. Uh, the other alternative is that people might work in, in workshops such as these, um, entangling uh, the hair, earning a wage of maybe $1.30 a day or something like that. Um, so here hair is alienated completely from its objects, from its origins, so much so that the workers I met had absolutely no clue where the hair had come from and absolutely no idea what it could possibly be used for. It is literally referred to as a cash crop, akin to chilies and onions, but more reliable since it's not weather dependent and it kind of comes in a kind of all year harvest. Um, so out of this rather unpromising looking human exuviae, culled from many thousands of heads, uh, quite luscious looking bunches can be extracted. And these are packed up and sent across the border uh, to China mainly. Uh, which has the largest concentration of hair factories, human hair factories in the world. So this is Suchang, known in China as, as Hair City. Uh, and here, in the context of these uh, factories, this type of comb waste 
is actually referred to as standard hair. It's the most common hair used. And it becomes ripe for acts of material transformation and even, I would say, racial reassignment, if you like, which can be achieved through all sorts of processes like dyeing, uh, bleaching, uh, curling, you know, so you would roll the hair around uh, wooden sticks and bake it uh, to achieve different uh, hair, hair textures. So out of this hybrid collection of waste hair, new hair types are sort of miraculously produced from European blondes. Uh, these ones, these wigs were destined for Manchester in the UK. Um, and a whole variety of, of popular Afro and relaxed hair textures targeted at the black hair markets in the United States and Africa and Europe, where the hair is very often given a kind of fictionalized uh, racial identity. Uh, you know, it might be sold as Brazilian or Malaysian or Peruvian, um, which gives, offers this possibility of variety uh, whilst at the same time keeping the actual origins and the kind of silent labor of this workforce uh, well out of view. But in case we should think that this is merely a contemporary phenomenon, this type of uh, alienating effects of contemporary globalization, it's worth noting that this is nothing new. Um, so uh, if we flip back to uh, the beginning of the uh, 20th century, we see a very big market in Europe for hair nets made out of human hair, um, actually accumulated uh, from the plaits of, of Chinese men. So again, combings, uh, initially made in Europe, uh, as, as in this demonstration here, but eventually the whole uh, industry shifts to China, secretly in fact, and um, where there's 50 to 100,000, uh, uh, half, sorry, half a million uh, women and children were employed making hair nets to suit Western tastes. Uh, and interestingly, the glamorous envelopes absolutely never mention China. This is kept hidden. And where the Chinese origins are invoked, it's usually whether there's a scare of anthrax or plague that's being traced back to hair nets uh, worn by women. A reminder, perhaps, that when hair origins do assert themselves in the hair trade, they very often provoke considerable unease. And this was certainly the case uh, in 2004, when the tranquility of pious Orthodox Jewish women from Brooklyn to Jerusalem was rudely disturbed by the revelation that the hair most commonly used in shaitals or wigs at the time was coming from temples in India, where thousands of pilgrims go to have their heads shaved in fulfillment of vows they're offer, uh, uh, they've made in relation to gods. So disturbed by this, uh, a very old rabbi uh, in, in, in Israel actually ordered rabbis from London to travel to India to investigate um, the phenomenon. And they were sort of shocked uh, by what they saw. Um, whoops, there we are. And, um, and they declared that this hair was not kosher. And they actually uh, demanded uh, uh, Jewish women to burn their wigs. Um, and this caused a considerable amount of pain and consternation because women were wearing wigs uh, you know, they were associated with virtue and keeping religious practice. So to suddenly see them as an abomination was really shocking, but also because they cost two or three thousand dollars a piece very often, and people didn't want to burn them. So the Scheitelgate affair changed the choreography of the Jewish hair market as companies began to ban Indian hair and, uh, and some began to actually employ rabbis to issue kosher certificates for the wigs to guarantee that they didn't contain this Indian temple hair, whilst others sought out new supplies of hair from Russia and the Ukraine. So the stories of comb waste uh, transformed into Brazilian weaves and of Indian temple hair recycled into Jewish shaitals offer a tiny glimpse of some of the many kind of entanglements and silences embodied in the human hair trade. So just returning then to my question, can hair ever be entirely dissociated from its origin and treated as a, as a mere crop? Uh, and in some ways, yes, the hair trade is proof that it can, and there's many products from, from the type of products we've seen here, but also rope, uh, oil filters, food additives, and so on, um, are also made from hair. But at the same time, stories of the fear of anthrax and idolatry, literally traveling through the hair back to attack the people who wear it, would seem to suggest that this human crop remains ontologically dangerous and that it retains, however mutedly, its potential to disturb.
Perfect. Thank you so much. Now we're going to have a video by Raffaele Mollica, wig maker extraordinaire. My name is Raffaele Mollica, and I'm a custom wig maker. In my many years of working in this art, I have watched people suffer from hair loss. I've come to understand much about the human condition and the perception of suddenly having to cope with the reality of losing one's hair. It has been my privilege to contribute to the alleviation of the despair, the anger, the embarrassment, the loss of confidence, even the fear of losing one's livelihood. These are just a few of the effects that hair loss causes in most people. Hair, for most people, is a significant and defining factor in their daily life. Just the thought of feeling singled out and unattractive is a serious handicap to one's daily routine. I feel fortunate to help people deal with this problem. And now, Dan Choi. Hello, good evening. Um, so I am in the hair trade. Um, so I thought I would take this opportunity to kind of share my experience of, uh, of how I got started in the hair trade and why I'm kind of doing what I'm doing. Um, but I don't have any of the experience. Um, I've never been in the industry. I just happen to be in a country and wanting to help um, the kids living in poverty. Um, so it's a little difficult to really give you an idea of my day to day um, because it involves pretty much going out every day, meeting women who need the money to pay rent, living expenses, university. So I thought I'd just narrate around a couple of photos that I was, um, that I have been able to take uh, in my operations, but I normally don't take these kind of photos. Um, so this girl, happens to live in this location. And as you can see those rooms, those are all houses. And I would say each of those houses are about the size of a New York City apartment. And each and in every one of those rooms is gonna be two parents and oftentimes at least two to three kids. She herself has two brothers. Um, and so the reason I got started in this industry is because uh, three years ago, I was living in Vietnam. And while I was eating out with friends, a young girl approached us. Um, in the restaurants in Vietnam are all outside and they're all, all on uh, plastic stools. And so this young girl approached us, but what I noticed about her was that she was barefoot, um, her clothes was messy, and her hair was short and uh, messy. And she was trying to sell gum and tissues to get by. And I remember just, uh, I was with my friends, and I just remember thinking, wow, it must be very difficult. She was really skinny and she looked like she hadn't been eating, but she was accompanied by a boy that was even younger than she was. So the girl was selling gum to my table and it just happens at that time, the table beside us was paying their bill and getting ready to leave. The boy noticed that and as they left, the boy walked over to that table and started picking at the food. The girl that was selling um, gum to my friends noticed that boy eating at that table and immediately went over to the table and just started eating with him. She shoveled a bunch of food into her mouth. Unfortunately, just a few seconds later, the waiter came rushing out of the restaurant yelling at her, uh, yelling at them to, to get away because he was afraid that they would be interrupting the, the guests of the restaurant. And so, when I was young, oftentimes, you know, like all kids, you would hear from your mom, don't waste food, eat everything. There's kids out there that are starving and would do anything for this food. And of course, you know, when I heard this as a kid, it would just go in through one ear and out the other. Um, and my mother, having been born two years after the Korean War, often told me of times where during her childhood, she would go hungry for days. And 
When I've heard that in the past, I didn't think too much of it because I was a young child. But when I saw this young girl and that young boy, it just came back to me. And in that moment, I realized this is what my mother experienced in her childhood, struggling to eat and survive. So what I noticed about these girls was that her hair was short and messy. And if you've ever been to Vietnam, most women have really long, beautiful hair. But that girl that happened to come to our table didn't. And so what I came to realize was when you are struggling to eat and survive, beauty isn't as important to you as, say, um, being beautiful and aesthetically uh, beautiful. Sorry. So when I thought about that, I thought, how can I help these kids in Vietnam? And what I, did, what I realized, once I realized that she had short and messy hair, I realized perhaps there's a way for me to source to her ethically at a far, fair market rate and then help them either whether it's paying for food, paying for rent. I've, I've met a lot of women that live actually under bridges, under tarps. And so having lived in Vietnam, I've, I've, I've been accustomed to seeing all of that. And, and I realized that the way that I was going to help, well, it was my hypothesis that I can help them that way. So I put up an ad, and lo and behold, I actually got a lot of students from universities and high schools that were interested in selling the hair. And so, and so this is a student named Twin. She's not the first student that I uh, cut hair from, but she's another student. And when we ask a lot of these students, why are you cutting your hair, it's, it's always because we need the money to pay for rent and tuition. And, and oftentimes I would ask, do you, do you work? Because most people, given that, uh, given that situation, would have a job. But it's, when you're a student, you don't really have the time to work. But in addition to that, there's not a lot of opportunities in Vietnam for people like for them to work. Because in Vietnam, everybody is struggling to survive. and so. When I realized this, I wanted to see if there's a way that I can help. In addition to providing that initial income, um, I devised a system where, uh, so we would be taken out to the countryside because a lot of the students would tell their, their friends and family that um, there's this person in Ho Chi Minh City that is buying hair at a fair market rate and we've been paid because um, scams are pretty common in Vietnam. So we would go out there, and what we'd find is that a lot of the children actually don't even have uh, money for school supplies because most of these people are farmers. And so oftentimes when we purchase the hair from these women, it would be these, so this is one girl, and then she recommended us to her sister, and then after that we actually cut her mother's hair as well, uh, but I didn't ask for a video. Um, and so what, so, we, we, start, we started seeing that a lot of women would refer sisters, aunts, mothers, grandmothers, neighbors. And so I wanted to see if there's a way for me to help them capitalize on that. And so I created that system where every, for every person that they refer, I give them a referral fee. And on average, to date, most women refer at least three to five women. Um, and so, as, as I've said, when we go out to the countryside, a lot of the, the farmers and the kids, they're, they're really struggling to survive, so they don't have e even money for school supplies. And so what we do is whenever we go out to the countryside, we will prepare things like that um, and then give it out once we get there. And so that on the left side is an ethnic minority group, uh, Cambodian, but living in Vietnam. And they're kind of outcasted in Vietnam, and so they live in areas where there's no opportunity for any kind of income. And so actually, fortunately, a, a media company came out to, to Vietnam to document the, the, the process. And that woman is somebody that just um, had sold her hair recently, but was scammed before that. Uh, this is Ms. Thuy. And so what we learned is that a lot of the women uh, used the money to actually buy farm animals. and so. It's first, it's to feed the family and then to raise livestock so that they can either sell it to their neighbors or at the market. 
Um, and in addition to that, because I had to learn how to create different types of hair extensions, I wanted to teach women who may wear hair extensions or not to actually learn how to do that so that maybe they can also get into the hair trade and um, uh, sell hair extensions maybe to you know, people that are in the network as well. And I found that uh, this one is actually, it wasn't just young African-American women who were interested, it was actually uh, well-established um, beauty professionals. And so that's been kind of the, the mission behind and the backstory of how I got started. Thank you. I always hate to interrupt the speakers seven minutes. We need to stick to it. But uh, now the video by Studio Swine, super wide interdisciplinary new explorers. Carmelyn P. Malalas, and I am the Commissioner and Chair for the New York City Commission on Human Rights. I always just like to get a sense of how many folks are familiar with the agency. Okay. So uh, the Commission on Human Rights is the city agency that is charged, we're responsible for enforcing New York City's very broad and very protective anti-discrimination and anti-harassment protections. Anywhere you live, breathe, work, exist in New York City, you are protected by what is generally considered to be one of the nation's strongest human rights, civil rights laws. And uh, I was appointed in late uh, 2014 and took on my role as chair and commissioner in February of 2015. And I will just tell you now that, you know, it is a really interesting time to be in the field of human rights, as you can only imagine, right? Um, and I oftentimes wonder allowed with my staff what we would be doing right now uh, if there were a different president and there were different people in Washington, D.C. But alas, we are, we are here now and, and doing what we do. You know, in the, past, um, in the past four and a half years, I want to say, we have really looked at ways that we could take advantage of the fact that New York City has such strong human rights protections and that New York City generally just as a locality has such will for human rights, to be looking at issues that we know people experience daily, uh, regularly in New York City that are related to discrimination and harassment, but also that are issues that we know nationally has real significance or real impact. Usually when I start talking about the legal enforcement guidance we put out on hair discrimination, and that's 
one of the things from our release, one of the, the visuals from our release. Usually when I, ha when I start off talking about it, I have to explain to my audience, like, why did we pick hair? Um, and, and I say that because when we first announced that we were focusing legal enforcement guidance on hair, the, the reactions kind of ranged from some people saying, you know, hair, why hair? Why are you putting all this time and energy? Why is New York City looking at hair? Why is it so important? To other folks who would say, I can't believe you even have to address this. I can't believe that people don't know the, the types of discrimination that occur around hair is a problem and that is actually a form of discrimination. So it's actually quite refreshing to be in a situation where the entire topic is on hair um, because it brings out why hair is so important, right? How personal it is, how much of an expression of individuality or culture or religion uh, or any number of factors or race hair actually is. Um, and so when we, so we're an agency where, you know, roughly half of our agency is civil law enforcement where we have you know, a team of mostly legal staff who take in complaints of discrimination or harassment from the public. Um, in New York City, there's 26 categories of protection, right? So there's, that's one of the reasons we are considered to have one of the strongest human rights laws in the country. But folks can come in, they can complain about, or they can file complaints of discrimination with us if they've experienced it on any number of categories. We have kind of the usual basic categories that you see across other jurisdictions like race, religion, disability, gender slash sex. Um, we also age. We also have areas of jurisdiction that are considered fairly uh, uh, novel for a jurisdiction. So in New York City, it's also illegal to ask about salary history in the context of employment. It's illegal to ask about credit history in the context of employment. It's illegal for most employers to ask about any sort of criminal history before a conditional offer of employment is made. And even after a conditional offer, if an employer wants to retract that offer, there's an entire process they must go through to make sure that their decision is not laced with some type of discrimination. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, protections that we enforce. And then the other side of the agency is, is really about education and outreach and making sure that we are within all of the, the communities throughout New York City, letting folks know what their rights are under the law, letting entities know what their obligations are under the law, and how we as a city can continue to promote and sustain diverse, inclusive spaces, right? So in the last four and a half years, we have really been focusing on, on spaces where we know that either we're going to put legal enforcement guidance out into the world so there is transparency in what the law says and how we're enforcing the law so people have that understanding and people also understand what the, the, the breadth of their rights are here in New York City. And so we will do that with especially new areas of protection where people you know, are still coming to understand what that means. But we will also do it in areas where we know that discrimination is occurring with such frequency or it has become so normalized that we're actually not seeing the claims of discrimination or harassment being filed. Because either it happens so often where people think to themselves, what's the purpose of me filing a complaint? Why should I even say this? This happens all the time. Or we know that people kind of self-police themselves and they say to themselves, I'm not even gonna, you know, I'm not even gonna try to live my truth in XYZ way because I know it won't be accepted well in XYZ spaces. And so we've really focused on those types of issues in the last four and a half years. And in recent years, so in, in late 2018, around the same time as you saw, you know, there was one of the pictures there of uh, the wrestler in New Jersey, and the video of that wrestler kind of went viral, where we saw yet another incident of discrimination based on hair that we know happens all the time. And in that incident, just to remind folks, it was a wrestler in New Jersey who was competing, and before he was able to compete, um, uh, the, the official in that space said he had to cut his locks. Apparently, even though there were other wrestlers who had similar length hair who did not have to cut their hair, but their hair was not worn in locks. Uh, and I saw this on video, and as did many of my staff, and we all kind of got together and we said, wow, there's another one. This continues to happen, right? Because this happened in a spate of just a few months where we were also seeing that kids at school were being told they could not return back to school 
uh, unless they did something to their hair because their natural black hair was considered to be unkempt. Or uh, newscasters who were told they had to do something with their hair because again, their beautiful natural hair was considered unprofessional. And so we said, okay, this is crazy. This is a form of race discrimination. Um, and we looked at what had been done in the past on this under the law. Um, and my background is actually as an employment attorney prior to coming into government, that's what I did for many years. And so from that background and experience, I knew that unfortunately under federal law, courts had basically bent themselves into pretzels to be able to say that discriminating against somebody because they're wearing locks or cornrows or braids or some other hairstyle commonly associated with black people, that that wasn't race discrimination. That because hair was, was changeable and mutable, that it was neutral and it was not a form of race discrimination. But those statements belied the experiences of so many people of black and African descent who said, of course, there is a, an impact very specific to black people. So having found no, uh, no challenges to doing that under our local law, what we did is we wanted to put out legal enforcement guidance to say that in New York City, it has always been the case. Since we've had race discrimination in New York City, which date back to the 1940s, it has always been the case that policing someone's hair in employment or public accommodations uh, because of their natural state or because it's worn in a, a hairstyle commonly associated with black people, that, that is in fact race discrimination. Um, and I remember when we were putting this together in my office, there were some folks who were like, that's great, we're doing it, you know, that's another piece of guidance. And I said, folks, this is gonna be big just because of the way it daily affects people, the amount of people it affects and the daily experience that people have had having to be humiliated in workplaces or schools because of it. And so we announced this in February of 2019, and, and as expected, it was carried across the country. It was, it was actually carried internationally. Um, and as I was being interviewed by different news sources, and I was telling the story earlier, I was being interviewed, I remember, by Al Jazeera, and they said they were leaving our office to then go to a hair salon to talk to people about their experiences with hair discrimination. And I said, if you want stories about hair discrimination, just go out on the corner and talk to some black people who have experienced this frequently in the workplace or at schools or in other settings. Um, because again, the daily indignity of, of this had been so normalized in those spaces. Um, so what we found, again, was that the, the idea of doing this was something that had been this undercurrent in many jurisdictions. And so what, what I'm proud to say is after New York City announced this, this legal enforcement guidance kind of drawing this line in the sand, we have then seen other jurisdictions follow, which I'm sure some of you have seen. So now it's New York State, California, uh, Maryland is working on one. Um, I think uh, Virginia or Michigan is working on one as well. But again, it speaks to the idea that people have to be able to be themselves, to express who they are, whether that is an expression of race or culture or religion or otherwise. So I hope you all, I, I know it was part of the reading, I hope you do take a look at, at the legal enforcement guidance. We're constantly putting out other types of legal enforcement guidance in other areas, as Paula said, and I hope you take a look at that as well, because again, we are a city agency, and if you're a New Yorker, we are working for you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Always proud of New York, aren't we? So two videos now. Tina Lassisi, a great PhD candidate from Penn State, and then Noliwe Rooks, who's the director of, of American Studies at Cornell University. We talk about hair in categories. We describe it as straight, curly, or wavy. And sometimes we use racial or ethnic categories like Asian type hair or African type hair. Scientists who work in dermatology, cosmetology, and forensics frequently use racial and ethnic terms when describing hair. And that gives the impression that these typologies are scientifically based. But in reality, both hair texture and color are continuous traits that don't really fit into categories. Part of my work involves developing methods that allow us to quantify hair morphology. We can objectively measure how tight a curl is. 
we can objectively measure the shape and size of the hair shaft. And in all my research, I've seen that hair curl and thickness are continuous traits, much like height or skin color. There aren't any distinct hair types or clear differences between racialized groups. So from a scientific standpoint, the data suggests that cultural categories are not only arbitrary, but also a poor descriptor of true variation in hair. When asked to answer the question about if black hair is political, the first thing I thought is it's impossible to imagine a culture or a society that loves black people that doesn't make a space for black hair, that doesn't love black hair, that doesn't uh, make it possible for people to express their creativity, uh, their culture, their geographic specificity through hair without putting up roadblocks. In order to love black people, you have to love black hair. Hair is, I think, a politics of a different kind. It's a, it's a medium that whispers race, that shouts gender, that makes endless forms of creative expression possible at the same time that it calls forth endless forms of surveillance and repression. Hair, black hair, uh, it is simply everything. Now I'd like to call on stage Ebony Davis. Hi, my name is Ebony Davis. I'm a model and activist and the founder of Daughter, which collects and allocates money for scholars to travel back to Africa. And I want to start my talk with a clip from the TED Talk I gave in 2017 called Black Girl Magic in the Fashion Industry. So just I remember entering a beauty supply shop at four years old and eyeing a just for me home relaxer box with a picture of a black girl about my age. She looked just like me, except her hair was silky straight. Please, please buy this for me, I begged my grandmother, and eventually she did. Despite the burn of chemicals on my scalp and the smell of sulfur that filled the room, I was entranced at the prospect of having straight hair. It was beautiful, it was celebrated, and I, with my kinky coils, felt inadequate. Over the years, I spent thousands of dollars at salons getting my hair relaxed and straightened, and thousands more on weaves and extensions to make my hair appear fuller and longer. I didn't realize it then, but I was gripped by insecurity at the tender age of four, and it stayed with me into adulthood. To be born black in America is to be born into a world that makes you feel inferior before you can even take your first step. It is to be under constant mental and spiritual attack. It was not only our bodies that were taken during slavery, but our identities as well. And we were stripped of anything that might have given us context to who we were prior to our abduction. This erasure and forced assimilation has yet to cease. From the time we are young, every inch of us is scrutinized. We are told that our hair doesn't grow and that it's too coarse, our noses are too wide, our lips are too big, and our skin is too dark. I used to look in the mirror for hours thinking how much more beautiful I would be if my eyes were blue or green, if my nose was a little smaller, if my lips were a little smaller, if my hair grew a little bit longer. Magazines where I would only see two or three black models amid dozens of white models made me feel like there was something inherently wrong with me. Something that needed to be changed because I didn't fit into society's narrow margins of beauty. A society dominated by white privilege that refuses time and time again to see people of color as equal. A society that profits at the expense of its most vulnerable citizens by destroying their self-esteem. This is the society we live in. This is the industry I work in. This is the fashion industry. <laughs>
Thank you. So as I mentioned, I gave that TED Talk back in 2017. It's called Black Girl Magic in the Fashion Industry, and it came about after I wrote a letter to the fashion industry um, in summer 2016 after the extrajudicial killings of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile by police. The letter talked about the correlation between the lack of value for black lives when it comes to dealing with the police and the lack of value for black lives in the fashion industry and the lack of representation when it comes to natural hair. I felt that it was my responsibility to write that letter because on the day I heard the news of Philando, Kil Philando Castile's killing, I also got a Calvin Klein campaign back and I was represented with natural hair for the first time. I had been in the model, modeling industry for four years up until that point, constantly straightening my hair, adding extensions, showing up to work and being humiliated by casting directors, by people, by hairdressers who weren't knowledgeable about how to do my hair, by art directors, by photographers who constantly made derogatory remarks about how I appeared. And it was my job to show up and feel and look beautiful. After I decided to go natural, I was also met with resistance from my agency, and they told me that rolled out of bed hair isn't gonna work. This was my natural hair, and it wasn't rolled out of bed. If you know anything about natural hair, you know that it takes a lot of energy and a lot of effort. Um, after I went home and wrote that letter, it went viral, and I was asked to do a TED Talk on the topic. What I want people to know is that it's so much deeper than hair. After I began to explore the ways my identity had been suppressed physically, it got much deeper and I realized that it was a mental health issue. I realized that the correlation between black women's beauty and black women's mental health is very strong and it's inseparable. We're constantly told that we're inadequate and that we're not good enough. We're constantly told that we're not valuable. We're told that we can't achieve certain things or have certain jobs or make a certain amount of money or be seen in certain spaces if we present ourselves a certain way. And, with, and because of those beliefs, we go, go out into the world with low self-esteem. We go out into the world believing the things that we're told about ourselves rather than what we know to be true. We are valuable, we are powerful, and we are capable. I want people to know that there's a programming that takes place. There's a programming that takes place that tells us who we should be and who we shouldn't be through stereotypes and singular narratives. And what I want for the fashion industry to realize is that we have a responsibility, and that was the point of my TED Talk. If we can create diverse stories and tell diverse narratives, we are giving the opportunity for, those to, for people to be seen who have been systematically unseen, systematically misrepresented, and systematically denied the opportunity to have their stories told. I typically wear my hair in an afro, but today I decided to wear braids. I took a trip to Ghana in December, and as I, as I mentioned before, that was the inspiration for me to start the daughter organization. I wanna give scholars, I wanna give as many scholars as possible the opportunity to return to the motherland to see that they have roots and they have history and they have heritage that they can depend on and they don't have to subscribe to the narratives that they've been sold about who they are and what they're capable of. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ebony. And now there's um, two videos by Anthony and Pat Mascolo, the founders of Infringe, that is a platform dedicated to hair culture, and then by Simon Skinner, a designer. We started Infringe because we wanted an inclusive, celebratory, non-commercial space. Where hair culture and hair creativity would be put first. There are great fashion, design, arts and cultural magazines out there. That hair always felt like an unwanted cousin. We understand authorship in hair is difficult and complex. And believe this is one of the reasons hair culture is diminished by the establishment. But no matter what anyone thinks about hair artists, this doesn't diminish that hair, positively or negatively, is essential to how we define ourselves. And is also key to how attractive or successful we feel. How we choose to identify ourselves within the cultural constructs of age, gender and race can be created through our hair image. And we can do this via one's own hair or hair that we have bought, borrowed or stolen. Communities are held together through the social service that our hair salons provide. Animals live longer if their hair is groomed and we believe we are no different. When we started, we nervously wondered if perhaps we would quickly exhaust all the interest in hair topics out there. 
But now we know we have barely scratched the surface. This MoMA Salon is a fantastic moment in celebration of what can be investigated and learnt about our lives by looking at the world through a hair lens. Hi, my name is Simon Skinner and I'm a product designer. One of my latest projects, Afropix, is a collection of Afrocombs inspired by a group of Afro Swedes. So behind each comb, there's a story, and behind each story, there's a person. And for me, working like this was a way to communicate authenticity among black mixed race identities. And by designing the first Swedish Afrocomb, I wanted to challenge the perception and self-image of Sweden and Swedish design. And as many of you know, the Afrocom itself works as a symbol for black power. And that says something about the value of embracing your natural looks. Hair is one of the most powerful tools we can use to express our identity. It works as a jewelry that follows us through life and that carries our DNA. So for me, as a mixed race Swede with Trinidadian roots, I feel like my hair is one of the most authentic belongings that I carry with me in life. And to me, it embodies the fact that I'm a, I'm a product of the culture that my ancestors crossed. Here's one of the combs from the Afropic collection. And it's inspired by a woman who grew up predominantly in a white neighborhood. She used to relax her hair to fit in and look like her mates. Today she embraces her natural looks and that's the reason why we use, used her hair as a decorative element in this comb. And by preserving her hair, it became a symbol of black beauty. And that's one example of what hair can symbolize. And now I would like to call here Lindsay Day. Hello. Oh, I gotta put this down. <laughs> Ebony's just a little bit taller than me. <laughs> it's funny listening to you talk, Ebony. I'm like, and I can just stay seated because <laughs> there's so much that's said. And um, when I first saw your TED talk years ago, um, I was moved to tears and again today. So now I'm like over here misty. Um, but I appreciate you so much. Whew. And she very much um, embodies why representation matters so much. Representation matters. Um, over the last about three years, representation has become sort of this buzzword um, that's been used to death by well-meaning, liberal-minded people. Um, but rarely are we given context to why does representation matter so much. Um, for centuries, black people have been depicted as less than human, as sexual deviants, as beasts of the field, fit for hard, works, as of hard work as criminals. Um, here are just a handful of images over the last you know, a century or so, but it persists even to this day. It's pretty, pretty alarming and shocking, um, but for people who, you know, have experienced this and felt this for years, it, it really isn't. It's, it's one of those things you see it and you're just like, here we go again, all right. Um, the history of media in this country has informed the world on how they should think about my people, um, and further how we should think about ourselves. Um, and that applies to hair, but is so much beyond just hair. Um, it's a microcosm of the macro issue of representation. Psychological effects. Seeing yourself represented in media is confirmation that you belong. 
How is a black woman to feel if she never sees true reflections of herself on television, in film, in, in magazines? I grew up in the 90s. We had some magazines. We had Ebony and Jet and Essence, and we you know, poured over them voraciously. But I still never or rarely remember seeing my mother's very tightly coiled texture uh, represented particularly on magazine covers or really in any, any media. Um, unless it was in its altered state. My mom even, you know, her hair was relaxed well into my adulthood, um, which means that she placed corrosive chemicals directly onto her scalp every six weeks or so. Uh, when I got to high school, I did the same thing. Um, when we shopped for hair products, the only things marketed to us were grease and relaxers and gel, things to alter the state of our hair. Um, they were like in a tiny dusty little section in the bottom of the beauty aisle called ethnic. So, you know, what is the little girl to think? Perhaps we don't belong here, or at least not as is. Perhaps after swim practice or playing with my friends, I should pull my hair back or fry my curls straight um, so that I can belong. And, you know, even in this era of representation, just months ago, I heard my own uncle call my mom a pickaninny. They have the same hair texture. What does that mean? <laughs> you know, my mom grew up in a time where she didn't even see black people on TV. Representation matters. Just seeing yourself and your hair as it grows out of your head, reflected in images, confirms that you exist and that you should persist. So we made Crown. And it's not just about giving the psychoanalysis, which we've done. It's about a persistent litany of imagery to say to black women, we see you, you belong here. When we started, we started because we didn't see much representation at all of black women, um, especially black women with natural hair. Uh, like, probably about the same time that Ebony started um, some of her work, I think it was the same as you said, summer of, seven, of 2016. And it's like, since there's been this wave, we've started to see more textured hair on magazine covers, um, and in advertising and elsewhere, and it, it feels good, and you see it, and you're like, yes. And on the surface, it's like, this is great. Things are going in the right direction. Um, it's like your suspicions were confirmed, and they're starting to understand. But then you open these magazines, and still, our stories are being told in a shallow way. Um, we're kind of, you feel this shallow effort of capturing black spending, like, okay, this is a trend, so let's put her on the cover, and then we'll just fill it with the same ads and the same content we always have, and, but we'll get those black dollars, because those add up, right? Um, and we notice that, as it always had been in Hollywood, media cho chooses its darlings and damn the rest. We see magazines clamor over the same small set of black faces, um, you know, obsessed, of course, with celebrity, as we are, um, you know, and they want you to be otherwise pre-approved in some way to be represented. This is Lupita Nyong'o. We love her. Love, love, love. She is us, she represents us, but she is not the only black woman. <laughs> you know, and it's like, I'm thankful that now we see much more dark-skinned women, and growing up, that was, that was a huge issue. Um, and there's more, but it's like, but there's more than one. <laughs> Where are the others? Um, going beyond the covers, we saw that the representation and coverage of black women was half-hearted and really didn't make a connection, um, really didn't try to make a connection. Um, and what's worse is we started to see content about black women for white women and for white consumption, kind of decoding and demystifying our hair, our baby hairs, all, this is why braids matter so much. And this is all of those things where we know that we're, it's okay when, to talk about us for clicks, 
but it's not really okay to go deep and to really understand because who wants to talk about it? Nobody wants to talk about this. Nobody wants to, to face the fact that this has been created on purpose over centuries to subjugate us and to create these divisions. Um, and the representation, quote unquote, that we see now is no different. This is the image of Crown Magazine and, and just working to go beyond and to show our beauty and our natural element um, and beyond just hair. This is a hair shop, but you see so much more than just that. And the material effects. So, you know, black hair, of course, can be kinky and coily and curly if it drives clicks, drives clicks and sells magazines, but not so much if you want to get a good job or to raise venture capital. Um, you constantly see, see, you know, oh, maybe you should uh, straighten your hair just for the interview or for that big presentation or for that big campaign. Um, there's, there's no shortage of kind of your auntie in your head saying you should conform, you should fix that, you should um, fit in and maybe then you'll have the opportunity to, to reach the big stage. Um, clearly, we could talk about this all night. <laughs> I know we're a little bit over time, but um, I look forward to taking your specific questions during Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for these great presentations. And wait, I forgot the questions, of course. Um, it has been a wonderful set of presentations, and there's so much that we could talk about. So just to frame a little bit the, uh, the questions, and also the questions that you might have for each other, not only that I have for you, I'd like to focus on communication, because hair um, really helps communication, invites communication between generations, between people. You just showed a salon, and uh, you both talked about your mother and grandmother. Um, and Dan, you were talking about the need to let people uh, know what's behind the hair trade. You know, so we all have so much to talk about. So I'm going to start with you, Dan. Do you think that people should know where their hair comes from when they buy extension and when they buy wigs, also to avoid the wig scandal that happened in the Jewish community, for instance? Um, I mean, yeah, I absolutely believe that uh, if, you do, if you do consume hair extensions, then you should know the origins of where it came from, and that's kind of what I'm trying to um, initiate. Um, but yes, I think that people should absolutely know where the hair comes from and who is benefiting and um, yeah, how they are kind of taking, a, uh, taking part in fair trade. How do you think that could happen? Do you think by just having it on the box, what kind, how could that information be delivered? Um, so a part of my mission is, as, I've, as you've seen, is, is I actually want to teach um, young black girls how to create hair extensions. Um, and that's because I found in, in, in I guess, my, my couple of years of operation is that, so I've met some um, pretty big names in the industry, and apparently I have the best hair in the industry because most uh, companies don't have what I have. And so I want to teach you know, young black girls and, and other, other, other ethnicities as well how to create wigs, um, how to create hair extensions, and then they can sell it into other communities that, that need it, whether it's uh, alopecia areata or the Jewish community or you know, just various uh, communities. Thank you. Ebony, you were talking about being brought to these beauty parlors and wanting the torturous products oh. to make your hair straight. And sometimes there's a bonding that happens between mothers and daughters, grandmothers and granddaughters in kind of torturous practices to make yourself more beautiful. My, my grandmother used to say, you know, to appear beautiful, you have to suffer. Right? Okay. So do you think that yours is the last generation that will experience that when it comes to 
hair. Yes. Yes. I do. My kids will be free. Um, and that means a lot to me. Like, I mean, there is a bonding that takes place, but I don't think it has to take place in the way that it traditionally has. Um, you know, getting ready for Easter Sunday and like getting your hair pressed and hot combed and curled and ready and um, all those things like that definitely is something that I think a lot, like the majority of black people can relate to and that's an experience that a lot of us have had and it kind of is one of those things that brings us together as a culture, but I think we can find other ways to come together as a culture. Um, and it's just so interesting, I, you know, I, I really respect the work um, that Dan is doing um, in regards to uh, alleviating poverty in these countries. However, when I hear um, this idea of like educating young black women on how to make wigs and then go sell them to the community, I think of crack cocaine. <laughs> I think of um, I think of drug dealers in the 80s who were, um, you know, given this drug that then like decimated the black community. Um, and that's kind of how I feel about like these products, these like weaves and extensions, like of course, you know, like I have extensions in my hair right now, but I just want it to be a choice. I don't want it to be something that we feel like we need. I don't want it to be an addiction. And I think uh, to a certain extent, it's been an addiction and it's been a need and a necessity, something that we've depended on, you know, a substance that we've depended on because that's how we've made our livelihood. That's how we've been able to survive. That's how, you know, we've been taught we have to present ourselves in order to be accepted in society. Thank you, got it. Carmelin, we, we know that, of course, you, you enforce and you uh, publish laws, but also whenever you use a stick, you also wanna use a carrot because that's the way to make things happen. Maybe it's not your official job, but I'm sure you think about it. So uh, employers, how did you approach them? How did you educate employers and make them understand the importance of accepting one's individuality? You know, I want to say this is one of those situations where the media kind of did our work for us. Um, you know, as I said earlier, uh, the, the frequency with which people have in their lifetime experienced some sort of discrimination based on their hair, whether it is because um, of the, you know, Eurocentric standards of beauty that were expected in a specific industry, and so I'm, of course, looking at Ebony on this, or it's because of um, something that teachers or, or rules at school that forced um, parents or, or kids to wear their hair in, in a certain way. It was, it was such that I think everyone had a story, or it was hard to find spaces where people did not have a story to show. So where we have in the past produced guidance where um, we've had to really explain, you know, why this is, what was underlying this. When we published legal enforcement guidance on why uh, trans folks and cisgender folks should be able to choose whichever single-sex facilities they use regardless of gender identity or gender expression, we had to do a lot of educating on that. When we released our guidance on hair discrimination, it felt more like a collective sigh of relief, like finally some actual government validation for the fact that people have been living under this crazy regime in schools or in employment um, where, where they were again forced to change who they were or what the rules were based on, in many cases, their race. And so I'm happy to say in this space there wasn't huge resistance to us because there had been so many people who had felt like, wow, this is a form of discrimination that has been very much normalized. We have had these rules in effect, or we've had had these standards of beauty in effect for no real good reason other than adopting, like I said earlier, these, these kind of outdated you know, Eurocentric standards that really don't make sense in, in, in the New York City that we want to live in or that a lot of people want to live in. Thank you. Emma, um, I wanted to ask you about your book, but first I wanted to also ask you, what's the situation like in England when it comes to discrimination, to hair discrimination? How is it different from what you have heard tonight? I think it's quite similar. Um, certainly there have been cases of uh, school children, uh, you know, sent home from school for having locks. 
uh, and we've had discrimination also in the media in relation to representations in magazines. So certainly both what Ebony and Lindsay were saying is, is very recognizable actually also in the British context. Well, now let me ask you about your book, your definitive tome called Entanglement. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of, uh, of readership did it acquire? Did it remain academic or did it really go beyond? Well, in fact, I, I, I was interested in writing that book for a broader audience and not just writing it for an academic audience. So in fact, the audience that it has has been quite broad and people have uh, responded to me from very different angles. It may be to do with uh, concerns about ethics in the hair trade. Uh, I've also had a considerable correspondence with members of the Orthodox Jewish community actually consulting me about uh, how to interpret Hindu hair rituals, in fact. And, and as a result of that, uh, to some extent, they've actually changed their stance in relation to the use of Indian hair in shaitals. Um, I've also uh, engaged quite a lot with, with different types of groups through exhibitions and so on. So it's been a kind of ongoing story that sort of grows out in, in different directions, I would say. And Lindsay, talking about publications. So Crown was founded two years ago, you said? In tw no, three years ago, 2016? Uh, 2016. 2016, 2016 first issue, yes. yes. First full issue. And uh, did it immediately explode? How did you think about it? How did you conceive of it? Um, really, we were inspired by a lot of what was already happening in um, the digital space, uh, YouTubers and that whole culture, people sitting in their rooms, you know, doing twist outs and broadcasting it across the entire world. Um, you know, something, those rituals that were always very, very, um, again, with your auntie or your mom or your grandmother and very intimate. Um, we were, we started sharing these things and learning ourselves um, and that went across national borders. And, and kind of seeing black women redefining themselves and their own beauty inspired us to kind of conceive of and our own experiences of why do we never see ourselves in magazines? Why, when I flip through pages, is it rare to find a natural strand of hair? Why does it have to be covered up or straightened? Um, and so we started, it was I think the end of 2014, just behind the scenes. Um, then we went out to, a, um, music festival here in Brooklyn, uh, Afropunk, and we had a little zine. We went out and had conversations with like a thousand black women, and we're like, hey, we made this thing, you know, it's kind of our MVP, and um, put it in people's hands, had conversations, got emails, grew our social media following, and then just kind of took off from there and ended up being an Essence magazine, I think, a couple of months later, and kind of HuffPost, and it kind of snowballed, and then we released our first issue that next summer. I would like to ask you if you have questions for each other, because some of you haven't met before, so maybe listening to each other's presentation, is there something that popped up that you really wanted to ask? And in the meantime, you get ready also, because I'm sure that in the audience there's a lot. Yeah, Emma, go I'd ahead. I'd like to ask Dan, what does a woman earn from selling her hair to you? Uh, I mean, it varies, because everyone has different la lengths, weights, um, but on the average, we would say probably about 70 to 90, depending on how much they want to sell. Mm -hmm. um, if they have at least 16 inches to sell, we can give them around 100. And how That's, much does that sell for on the market here? It depends on what, uh, it depends on the end product. Um, if it's, if it's going to be something wefted, not much more, so it's not really feasible. Um, but if you make it into a wig, then it can be uh, feasible. Just to come back on that, so when I was uh, seeing people selling their hair in Myanmar, they were receiving about seven pounds for very long uh, hair. Mm. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to ask um, Lindsay and Ebony, you know, I feel like the last, the last maybe three and a half years have been like crucial in this space, whether it's like um, natural hair movement or there's been so much in terms of more in media out there, either representationally or like back to natural. Film by Jillian Scott Ward, Crown, there's Crown Acts now. People often ask uh, us at the commission, you know, what prompted our hair guidance and, you know, we have our own origin story in the last two years. But I'm curious from your perspectives, it really does seem like these last three and a half years have been crucial. There's, there's just been much more of an explosion on, um, on recognizing 
the beauty and the power of you know of one one being able to choose their hair, um, and also on the beauty, frankly, of natural hair. And I'm curious from your perspectives, what do you think is timing wise? What, is, what do you think has prompted it in the last few years? I mean, if you in fact agree with my premise that the last three and a half years have been yeah, crucial. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think my answer is pretty similar to how Crown Magazine started, where in the digital space you were just seeing, you know, twist outs and braids and things that you had never seen before. That's how I decided that I wanted to start wearing my hair natural because I never felt like I had a texture that I could wear natural. I thought it always had to be straight because um, I, I, I wasn't knowledgeable on how to style it because I didn't see myself represented, you know, with a variety of styles and magazines and movies and things like that. Um, and so I, I like Instagram, for example, became really huge in like 2014, 15, 16. And you started seeing like independent bloggers and like channels like black women just like stepping up and telling you what products they use and how they style your hair. And it kind of like empowered me and I, and I felt like I could do the same thing. Um, and then like obviously this presidency and just what we're going through socially and feeling like we have to reclaim our narrative in every way possible. And I think as a black woman, reclaiming the narrative around your hair is so important because it starts with hair, but it goes so much deeper and you have to start to ask yourself, in what ways am I being oppressed, repressed, you know, um, told that however I choose to express myself is invalid or wrong. Um, and so for me, my natural hair is an expression of my push against the status quo. You know, me wearing my afro, as small as that may seem to someone, is me giving my middle finger to, you know, the presidency, giving my middle finger to everything that's happening, happening in Washington, D.C. right now. Yeah, I think, you know, my mom lived through the civil rights movement, the black power movement, she had her fro, but somewhere along the line, it was kind of like, okay, tighten it up, get a job and, you know, conform. And I think to some degree, there is that defiance from the black power movement of like, you know, the middle finger up. But I think also there's been a huge shift in um, the, like just the realization that, wait, hold on, I'm putting, like lye and corrosive chemicals directly on my scalp. I mean, good hair. I, th I know my mom for sure cites that as a reason that she decided to go natural. She was like, she saw him drop a metal um, can into relaxer and it melted. Mm -hmm. It's like, this has been going on her head for like probably decades. Um, and so that for sure, I, I know that particular movie was a big catalyst for a lot of people. Um, and really, it's a, it became also hand in hand with a health consciousness, um, an increase in, you know, like you talk about mental health, but our physical health as well. Um, my mom, I think, ended up going natural when she, um, she stopped relaxing her hair first when she found out she had breast cancer. And it was just like that light bulb moment. And she kind of started looking into all of the chemicals that she was putting in her body. And it was just like, oh my gosh, like this is insane. Um, and I've seen that represented in a lot of other people in my um, world, in my community, that it was kind of a health consciousness. And, you know, I want to work out. I don't want to have to sweat my hair out or all of these different things that we kind of fought through for so long because it was just like, well, you got to make it work. You can't go out looking like that. Um, you know, it, it and I, hand in hand with this seeing the representation, seeing so many women, seeing, you know, you can pick up your phone and see hundreds and thousands of women that are doing the same thing. And so that all coupled, all compiled together, create, created sort of this movement and this um, momentum. Uh, I would like, I, I don't know if you allow me, Ashton, can I ask you something? Do you mind? Because Ashton Applewhite is here and she's an expert in aging and she participated in, in other in a salon that we did in age. We didn't talk about gray hair. Would you mind saying something about the politics of gray hair or lack thereof? Ask them. Oh, ask them? I can ask them, but maybe, okay, I can ask you. Does anybody want to talk about that? I should say I'm an expert on ageism, not aging. Um, so my question is, <laughs> they're related, God knows. Um, gray hair, does anyone ever want a wig of gray hair? Do old Hasidic women get 
old gray wigs and is there an analogy between covering our hair, dyeing our hair just to cover the gray and to pass, if you will, for younger and relaxing hair or you know, straightening it, et cetera, for women of color, um, that's interesting or valid or not. So let's start with the wig of gray hair. The wig of gray hair. Uh, it's very difficult to buy wigs of gray hair. They're, they're very difficult to get hold of. But interestingly, sort of looking in the, in the Jewish wig market, people don't seem to want them either. You know, the, the wig also becomes a way of, 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 of uh, defying age or at least masking it. But uh, on the other hand, which is quite interesting, is that historically white hair has actually been the most expensive hair in the market because it's very difficult to maintain it in its state. It tends to go yellow. And uh, so white hair is, 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 is complex to obtain. Uh, and the only white hair I, I've, I've seen on the market has actually been white uh, yak hair. Um, that yak? sometimes Yes. And that might be used, um, uh, the context in which I'd seen it used was actually for making beards for Hasidic men um, who had hair loss, who had alopecia. And for a man, a Jewish man uh, within that Orthodox community to be seen without a beard and without the chaos is 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 absolutely impossible. And 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 so uh, this this wig maker in New York actually was making um, uh, beards and chaos for for uh, Jewish men with alopecia. Wow. Okay. Now about the passing. Mm -hmm. Lindsay, do you want to talk about it? Um, I don't know that I can speak too much to that particular question. Um, yeah, I don't think I have, a, have much to say. You, Ebony? I mean, I think the proximity to whiteness is obviously is, is something that has been idealized for a very long time. And I think the proximity to youth is also something that has been idealized. I know this from my experience in the fashion industry where even at 21, 22 years old, I was afraid of aging out. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you know, because they're bringing girls in at 14 and 15 years old and, you know, putting them on the covers of magazines and, and things like that. And it's almost this like sort of perverted thing where it's like feeding on this, this raw youth. Um, and so, yeah, I think there is this like, you know, th there's the certain ideals and things that we um, put on a pedestal, just like as a society. Well, I won't say we, but um, certain people put on a pedestal in society, um, whiteness, youth, things that we have um, determined are the standard. You know, I think that the way that we treat our hair and the way that we style our hair is all related to that. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Marco, and then I'm gonna come to the lady. No. Yeah. Just one quick word. Uh, I've been hearing a lot relaxer. Obviously, it's the hair is not relaxing when you put that. You're basically putting chemicals on it to make it more flaccid. And, and is there any movement to change words around that? And saying like, yeah, you're killing your hair or something. You're putting chemicals on that because you're not relaxing it. Relaxing is where you actually wellness. And there's all wellness movement, mental health but that's not relaxing. Is there anybody working on words or, not, or changing that? Um, not that I know. I think relaxer has become a lot less popular, <laughs> as the statistics say, um, and show the sales have plummeted over the last, I don't know, five, 10 years or so. Um, I think the product itself is probably more harmful than the word relaxer. But it yeah. is a fascinating point. I think yeah. that uh, I've always been fascinated in that word because it seems like a little more of a sort of torture chemical than, a, than relax. The image of relaxation is something that's very I think different. It's relaxing the kinks. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> making yeah. it, yeah. making yeah. white people relaxed. As uh, <laughs> <laughs> who's, the, who's the, the comedian that said that? But that is also consistent with marketing, right? And branding right. something to right. be that is we know harmful yeah. or we're difficult, and yet we we put it out there as Absolutely. something relaxing. <laughs> Yes, the lady over there. As everyone here, I've noticed in the last five years or maybe a little bit more, I've noticed white teenagers, often college students, wearing, uh, putting their hair in rows. And in sometimes in very complicated African styles, it looks like. But, you know, I, I think it's probably easy 
to look at them and just kind of sneer. Uh, like, how much do they know about what their image means? But then another part of me thinks that as human beings, we seem to have this unlimited desire to transform ourselves. So I just wondered what the thoughts are up there about this kind of phenomenon. Is, there, is it always shallow? Is it always just about style? Can it be more profound and perhaps more positive? And we can go back to Bo Derek. <laughs> It's not so difficult. Oh, yeah. Fair mm -hmm. means. Yeah. Um, I think it would be wonderful to live in a world where it was that simple. Um, but I think the reality of it is that we have, as a people, black people, have been, have been stripped of culture, have been told to conform to a particular way, have done all of these different things and fought through all of these different um, sources of oppression, not just hair in the hair aisle, but in the corporate spaces, in even trying to get into the corporate space to begin with, trying to get a job, again, trying to raise capital. Um, we own way less land, we own, we have way less wealth. There's all of these things that are tied to a singular mission and a singular force um, to oppress us, so it's like, Sure, wear your braids. Uh, I mean, to me, that is less important than all of the other things that were kind of listed. Um, and, and it, to me, it just is kind of a slap in the face that my ancestors have, has, have had to con had to conform to all of these things, and then now it's a fad and a trend. And still, if one of us walks into an office with our hair that way, it's like, oh depending on the office, maybe some are more friendly, but some offices will be like, oh, you need to get, you know, I mean, just a couple years well, not ago, you've been told. after the commissioner has told them what to do. <laughs> right, I mean, 2019, yeah. we're legislating against racism. <laughs> like, that's very telling. This, uh, I think the appropriation of black styles happens in the fashion industry all the time. It's like, it's nothing new, but, you know, when we do it, it's ghetto, when we do it, it's hood, when we do it, it's labeled all of these things, and then when someone else does it, it's cool, and it's trendy, and it's the new, you know, it's on Refinery29 now, and it's the new thing, and... And, and it's monetized. And then it's monetized, you know, and, and we are not the ones who are receiving the money from it, because it's been stolen from us. And so, all of those things have to be taken into consideration. It's not like, oh, I'm just looking at Becky with a side eye because I'm jealous of Becky. I'm looking at Becky because Becky's wearing braids and now she's getting praised and, and when I wear braids I get called ghetto and I get denied jobs and I get turned away and you know my, I get my locks cut off. Mm -hmm. Understood. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jenny, you deserve it. <laughs> I have a question for you and correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah, give it a microphone. <laughs> Forgive me if I'm wrong, Lindsay, but wasn't there an appropriation of cover art that you had for Crown? Um, yes. <laughs> um, yes, uh, Nylon Magazine made a very, very similar cover to um, our Love Issue cover. I would like um, to see it. <laughs> I know, I wish it's I It's a gone. beautiful, it's gone. beautiful bye magazine. Bye. <laughs> yeah, and, well, that, that was the interesting thing that it they decided to have a Black History cover, um, the Black History Month after they shut down their print issue. So I thought that was very interesting. It was a cover, a digital cover, in Black History Month during a time where it's very trendy to be black, but had never had a Black History Month issue ever in the history of the magazine. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, and then they chose to make it look exactly like ours. And the magazine is gone. See, they had no <laughs> fuel anyway. Um, yeah, she tell. I also have one really practical question and one question that's for all of you. I have a particular question about um, hair that's kosher versus hair that's not kosher. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could answer the question in your conversations with Jewish community and rabbis when they were dealing with this thing about Indian hair, how were they defining which Indian hair would be kosher 
and, and which was not. I'm just, I mean, I really am curious yeah, about this when you were sure. talking about it. And then for everyone, um, I've been thinking as we were talking a lot about this idea of um, reparations and this idea of reclamation as a process of reparations. And many of you on stage have taken that um, as a personal mission and professional mission. And because we have a commissioner on the panel as well, I was wondering about kind of that next step. So changing policies, visibility, right? But like what actual education is needed to change people's hearts? Because the, the example of the workplace is, is a really good one where people can still follow the rules, but you can still feel extremely alienated for not looking like or talking like or being from the same place as most of the people around you. So just wondering if you guys have any thoughts about that. So let's start with the kosher Indian hair. Yeah, the, the Indian hair thing is, is quite complicated. So the reason why it was sort of banned in 2004 was because, not because it was sort of foreign and Indian hair, but because it was, it was thought to be a, 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 a idolatrous hair, because it was thought to be hair that was offered to gods, and therefore that was an act of idolatry, wow. and a Jewish person is not supposed to profit from anything or have any association with idolatry. But the question of whether it was idolatry or not remained very ambiguous. And in fact, since writing my book, I've had correspondence with a number of uh, Haredi rabbis, in including the head of kosher certification for the chief rabbi of Ben Brek in Israel, uh, who actually wrote to me to ask me about, uh, you know, what is the status of hair within these rituals in the temples? Because in fact, it's not that people go into the temple and have their head shaved in front of the idol in the temple. The hair is actually shaved in these kind of separate uh, 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 spaces. So at the largest temple, they've got 650 barbers shaving heads all day long, but inside uh, purpose-built uh, uh, tonsil halls. And the hair is immediately taken off uh, for preparation and for sale. So it isn't actually taken into the temple at all because it would be considered a sort of polluting substance. So in fact, uh, more recently, um, uh, uh, for example, the chief rabbi of Ben Ibrek, uh, uh suggested, partly in response to this type of research, that in fact it was not idolatrous and that in fact in, uh, Jewish women could uh, wear the Indian hair. So these things, you know, are open to interpretation. And now as to the education part of the question. Uh, you know, we have been thinking a lot at the agency about things that would be considered reparative, but, you know, I, I'm going to kind of broaden that a little bit. Things that are, in my mind, reparative really have to be something taken from the state, since the state has been really the, the site of so much um, oppression of black people in this country. And so I tend not to think of things necessarily as reparative when we're dealing with violations of um, our law by private entities. I think of them more in terms of what can we put out there that's more restorative or transformative in the space. So, for example, there could you know there is um, there is a case um, at the agency that was recently or uh, you know in the process of being. Um, conciliated or settled, as we, we call it at the agency, where part of what would have to happen in order to resolve the case, rather than imposing fines or penalties that I don't think really go that far in being in changing uh, attitude or impact, um, we are instead, in lieu of fines or penalties, we're instead saying to the entity that has um, that has violated the law, you know, um, we want to see you put up internship programs. It's, so in, in the situation, the, um, the entity that violated the law was a, uh, a fairly uh, uh, established hair salon chain in the city. Really? And um, in that situation where um, uh, it was a, an employment discrimination related situation where they had certain standards of how they wanted their employees to wear their hair that violated the law. We said, you know, um, we want to see you put together some internships to bring more women of color or people of color into the hair industry and the hair space. We want to see programs such that 
your hairstylists actually learn how to style black hair. We want to make sure that you're doing what you can to be diversifying more the industry as both an employer and as a, a space where people learn their craft. Um, and thinking through other ways that taking a more kind of restorative or transformative framework, we could be having a larger impact in that industry. And so that's just an example of something, but I could see it other spaces where depending on you know, uh, uh, what the entity w would be that would violate the law in this space, let's say it's a school, part of what could be more restorative then is making sure that part of their curriculum focuses on some of the history that, um, that Lindsay and Ebony were referring to earlier or making sure that programmatically people at the school who are faculty or teachers are also themselves going through some sort of workplace training or, uh, or modules on really understanding the, the impact of, of racism or colorism in, in their schools or at their workplaces. So I think we, t we're, we take kind of a more broad approach that way because we want to have impact beyond whatever sort of you know, other damages or remedies an individual might have if they're the one bringing the, the case to the agency. I would like to leave the last question to Sam Ozer, because this salon is really her baby, and uh, it's going to be the last salon that she does with us, because she, yeah, I know, now we have Tia No, Sierra Feras, who's over there, she's going to be with me for the next 12 months, and we're going to do great, but mm -hmm. Sam, this was your baby, do you have your, like, question that you've been like burning to ask? And questions are, I feel like you've covered a lot of my questions, and Should have, should have known because you did this last year. Um, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't have to be a question that you've already asked. You can no, just no, like. I'm trying mm -mm. to think. I mean, I want one. I want one that's like not too loaded and like everyone could answer kind of like a, almost anecdotally quickly. I mean, I think we've talked about this, but maybe we've talked a lot about natural hair, but the idea maybe of like hair more as like adornment. Um, or something that can be beautiful or something that can be embellished, whether that's adding something to your hair, whether it's putting a wig on, whether it's styling your hair as a crown, as a piece of yourself. Um, so I don't know if anyone has like any anecdotes with their own hair and their own experiences, um, which is kind of a basic thing. But if anyone has like interesting things to share, add, or something they've seen that's not necessarily themselves. About hair is adornment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not really. I mean, if I have an anecdote, I suppose it would be that, that since uh, doing this research, I've actually been collecting my own comb waste, and I've now got oh, really? enough to stuff a small cushion. <laughs> oh, uh, really? Yes, oh, my God. <laughs> well, I was curious to see, you know, what does it now mean? Now I feel like I've wasted so much. <laughs> yeah. I could be rich by now. <laughs> Anything that you also have or you want to share? Do you go to those hair wars and uh, do you ever attend? Is that even on your horizon or it's something that's outside of your purview completely? Attend the what? The hair wars, you know, those big festivals of like hair artists. I went to the oh. PS1 well, last one, it was like amazing, but it was more art than life, you know? Um, I haven't been to many, many of those. I actually would love to talk to um, the reparations question. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I am um, 100% for reparations for the descendants of slaves in this country. Um, and I think, you know, the workplace is one thing, um, but really ownership is, is the next step. Like, beyond just education, we have to own platforms, we have to own companies, we have to own all of these different things, um, but because we, ha we do not have wealth, like the numbers state that we do not have wealth, um, you know, there, in, in our latest issue, Money and Power issue, there is no shortage of articles that explain why we do not have wealth, um, if you're interested in learning more. Um, there's also a piece by Dr. Jahi Issa on the illegal, illegal importation of slaves into this country and um, why all of the implications of that. Um, but 
ownership is truly the answer, but ownership is only part of it because ownership with no funding, you know, 2% of venture capital go to women. So you can imagine how much go to black women um, and to black people in general. And so we can own all of these little companies and have Instagram pages, but um, if we don't get venture capital, the dollars have to come from somewhere, whether that's private capital, et cetera. Um, and so I really don't think anything is gonna change as long as the same institutions are putting out the same messages and the same things. Um, it really, it, it's up to us to change it, but we need resources to do so, so. Absolutely uh, right, yeah, you're Speaking done. on that, um, that is the problem that I'm trying to solve. Uh, so. mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's a big problem, that of ownership and uh, how power is divided. We'll get there one day. But I want to really thank this panel. I want to thank Emma from, for coming from London. I want to thank Lindsay for coming from LA. I want to thank Dan for miraculously being here and not in Vietnam. I want to thank Ebony for being here and not in Paris, or back from Paris right now. And I want to thank the commissioner, because any New Yorker is busy, and one that works for the city of New York and is the commissioner of human rights is busier than, than all of us combined. And then I want to thank Sam for a great salon and a great year together. I want to thank Theano for her baptism of fire, because this was quite a salon to prepare. I want to thank the kitchen for this amazing hospitality. And then I want to thank you for braving the uh, terrible rain that came down at the last minute and being here and being always the greatest audience. And uh, I'll see you, at, well, in the back there for our snacks. And the wine is from MoMA, so it's the usual mediocre wine. But, you know, at least you know that we'll all consume it happily together. And uh, so stay with us. Let's have a drink together. And then we'll see each other officially at the next salon, which will be back at MoMA. So thank you, great panelists.